Hello again. It's probably fair to say that very few viewers will be familiar with, or indeed even have heard of, the Children and Young Persons Harmful Publications Act of 1955. This piece of legislation, though, is worth considering for the light which it sheds on modern anxieties and neuroses about things such as smartphones. Strange to say, there was very strong opposition throughout the 1950s by many teachers and not a few parents to the reading of comics, which were believed to harm children mentally in a number of ways, not least by making them unable to focus on and absorb longer printed text. There was a widespread feeling that the reading of comics tended to shorten children's attention spans and harm their vocabulary. Some of the worries, by the way, that we currently have, in fact, about TikTok and the use of smartphones. The captions and speech bubbles in comics were usually composed of simple short words, and some people worried that this didn't stretch a child's ability to read. Comics were discouraged at school and forbidden in many middle-class homes. Even so-called educational comics, such as Look and Learn, were frowned upon by a lot of teachers. It was not only educational considerations which were causing harm, however. Other and graver fears were being expressed in the 1950s about comics. Comics for children were a relatively new medium at that time, and although they're now remembered favourably as one more of those relics from a gentler time, they were felt then by many professionals to be undesirable and even dangerous. There had been story papers for children for many years, things like The Magnet, which of course introduced Billy Bunter to the world. In the early 1920s and early 30s, new magazines for children came along. Hotspur and Wizard carried exciting and fantastic serials for boys. Although illustrated with the occasional picture, these papers consisted of pages covered with densely printed text. True, they were sometimes dismissed as trashy in content, but it was undeniable that children were actually reading when they'd leave through Hotspur, and the content of the stories was largely unobjectionable. All this changed just before the beginning of the Second World War, when comics as we now understand them appeared on the market simultaneously in Britain and America. There had been much earlier incarnations of the format, comic cuts having been published as early as 1890, but children's comics as we know them really began circulating in the late 1930s. In June 1938, Superman made his debut in America in the first edition of Action Comics. The following month saw the publication of what would become one of the most popular British comics, The Beano, which introduced Lord Snooty and his pals to the world. The very different characters of Superman and Lord Snooty thus appeared for the first time within weeks of each other. The previous year had seen the first issues of Dandy in Britain and Detective Comics in America, the comic in which Batman was first featured in 1939. It's difficult in retrospect to understand what a menace comics were thought to be to children in the 1950s. Today we see them as representing all that was harmless and good about childhood at that time. The idea that comics featuring Superman and Lord Snooty could have been seen as subversive, insidiously promoting homosexuality, damaging to education and likely to incite crime and disorder must seem vanishingly unlikely to viewers. <clears throat> Nevertheless, concern about comics and their effects upon children and young people began in the United States and spread to this country, resulting eventually in a moral panic which led to a hastily enacted piece of legislation aimed at tackling what came to be seen as a terrible scourge. In 1954, a book was published in America which summed up the fears that many parents and teachers had about the new medium of children's comics. Comics in the accepted modern format had only been around for 15 years or so and thus qualified as a modern phenomenon. 
Seduction of the Innocent, by psychiatrist Frederick Wertham, set out on its cover the theme which Wertham expounded in the book, the influence of comic books on today's youth. Wertham was not concerned with this or that type of comic. He condemned them all wholesale, even Superman, whom he described as a fascist, and Batman, who was, according to Wertham, enjoying a flagrantly open homosexual relationship with his young Walt Robin. Reading through Seduction of the Innocent today is an eerie experience, for the entire thesis could have been taken from a modern newspaper denouncing the perils and ill effects of the internet on children. The main thrust of Wertham's argument was that repeatedly seeing images in comics could cause children to view such behaviour or events as being somehow normal. This was, he suggested, a major cause of juvenile delinquency. Attention was also drawn in the book to the fact that scenes of violence were accompanied by advertisements for air rifles and knives. It was, according to Frederick Wertham, as though those producing the comics were setting out to promote antisocial behaviour. We must remember that British comics too carried advertisements for air guns, to which nobody at the time took exception. In addition to his denunciation of superhero comics, Wonder Woman was clearly a lesbian, according to Wertham, the genre known colloquially as horror comics came in for condemnation, featuring, as they did, scenes of graphic violence and gore. If Batman contributed to children becoming confused about family structure and Superman causing to embrace un-American attitudes, then it was the horror comics which made sex maniacs and violent criminals of them. This particular type of comic gave rise to one of the greatest moral panics involving children in 1950s Britain. These so-called horror comics were being imported from the United States in the years following the end of the war, and after Seduction of the Innocent became famous, a campaign started in Britain to stamp out the dangerous new publications. In 1954, the National Union of Teachers staged an exhibition in London of what they considered to be some of the more harmful material being circulated. A reporter from the Manchester Guardian went along and reported on what he saw there. Skeletons embracing young women... Scaly monsters doing appalling things to brunettes in tight dresses and barely clad girls. <coughs> Watching the approach of axes thrown by blue hands. There is a morbid preoccupation with death and rotting corpses. Truly, these were the video nasties of the time. The one question about which everybody seemed a little vague was what harm these comics showing skeletons and murderers actually caused to children. Journalists were told that statistics painstakingly acquired over several years by a master in a secondary modern boys' school show that bright children soon become bored by horror comics and reject them, but the less intelligent are more susceptible and read them over a much longer period. This is the danger. From this reading of the situation, the danger appeared to be simply that unintelligent boys would waste their time reading these comics. But why that would be a bad thing was not at all clear to anybody. It's in the nature, though, of moral panics that reason tends to go out of the window as everybody gets caught up in the rush to condemn whatever it is that's threatening society. It was just the same with horror comics. <clears throat> Whether action should be taken by the government, or on the other hand if parents should take the initiative, the plain fact was that millions of these comics were floating around and something had to be done about them. The Archbishop of Canterbury had a meeting with the Home Secretary, Lloyd George, during which he talked of the strong public feeling aroused by horror comics. Once the Archbishop of Canterbury had joined the fray, it was only a matter of time before legislation was framed which would protect children from American comics. The Children and Young Persons Harmful Publications Bill was duly drawn up and by the early spring of 1955 was making its way through Parliament. In 
There was much debate about the best way to define a horror comic, and at one point it looked as though newspapers too would be included within the scope of the bill. Common sense prevailed and the possibility of press censorship sank into oblivion. There have only ever been two successful prosecutions under this Act, both in 1970. Smartphones are just the latest in the long line of things children have access to that we have become frantically worried about over the last couple of thousand years. In the description to this video, I give a link to an essay of mine on my Substack account, which gives some uh, accounts starting 500 BC of the sort of panics that people have had about what children are looking at and reading and thinking about. Uh, click on it, you can read it for nothing.